Good to be with you tonight. Glad to see y'all made it in from all the places y'all be and all the things you've done. John chapter 9, John chapter 9. Jesus had told them that he was the light of the world and he runs into uh, a situation where he has to begin to uh, explain to them whose children they are and he lets them know that he is qualified and can be linked with and over and over again he calls himself God. And in verse 59 of chapter 8, they try to stone him, but he goes out from them, unless uh, the grace of God uh, be null. It was not his time, and he had to call down fell legions of angels and do away with all of us. And if he had done that, we would have deserved it, what we got. But thank you for his mercy and his ability you'll find that uh, Jesus is very good at that. Letting people who need to see Him, see Him, and being able to pass by those who will not give Him a chance. Looking at the news today, there were a couple of articles about the school shooting and how uh, people were tired of folks praying to God about things or asking for God's mercy and focusing on God during this tragedy and learn what God would want you to and, and how uh, ridiculous that was. Uh, they forgot, like everyone else seems to forget, God did not bring sin into this world. Sin was found in the heart of an archangel and in his rebellion he swept with him one third of the other angels. These were creatures who truly did have free will. And God sets up a plan, forms an earth, lays down in this earth a man and a woman, male and female, and uh, in the midst of the most perfect garden there ever was, where they could have intercession with God. Think about that. The Bible records that he would come down in the cool of the day. Was it so they could pray with him? No. Uh-uh. Was it because he needed to find out what was going on? No. Uh-uh. It's because he wanted to have a relationship with them. They were made for him. To know him. To enjoy God. To live for him. And there in the midst of the garden was one, one rule that needed to be kept. And there the old serpent the old dragon himself, the devil, the slanderer, Satan, the accuser, comes and begins to have a conversation. And his conversation leads to the downfall and open rebellion of both man and womankind so that sin enters in. And when sin entered in through that channel, Adam and Eve's offspring inherited that sin nature. And all that the sin nature attracts, right? Death and disease and gluttony and lust and filth. And all of that stuff just comes in. And here is a time in our life where the madness and the devouring and the things that Satan would do to murder other people all of that stuff has entered in to this time where now our folks uh, are blaming God for something man did for himself. When God is steady holding out the light and God is steady giving the living water to all who receive it, God is steady opening up a universal call to come, uh, all who would come to Him uh, to change this course. And yet, because Satan is a murderer, right? Read that. Jesus diagnosed that. He was a liar. And when he tells a lie, he tells it of his own resource. The idea is that they tried to make God into a murderer. And our Bible tells us that he's not willing that any should perish, but all 
should come to repentance. So sin entered in, and disease entered in, and death entered in. And in John chapter 9, we see the results in one man's life of disease and decay. And then we see what Jesus does as the light of the world. John 9, 1 tells us, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. Obviously, this was someone who was well known. Uh, someone who was brought to the temple in which by he might beg, right? If he could not work and he still had to eat, he had to beg. Uh, just like the man who couldn't walk in the book of Acts. They would bring him up there and he would sit there. And remember, Jesus had been going back and forth at least since the age of 12, back and forth to Jerusalem, in and out those doors, especially a whole bunch in these last uh, two and a half to three years that John covers here. And, and so the idea and the thought was that everybody knew that this man had been blind from birth. This is a congenital defect. Best we can tell, this may be uh, one of the, the only times in the Bible that we see where Jesus heal somebody with such a disease. Now we know that he had healed a man who had been infirm for a long time, but not one from birth. And his disciples asked him, as he passed by, Jesus may have looked over that way, or the disciples may have bumped into him, or whatever's going on, and say, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Now, the Jews had an idea, the Pharisees had an idea of, of that if you were righteous and did rights, it's called legalism or, or works religion, then God could bless you. If you had done wrong or evil or sin or anything like that, then God could not bless you. And Jesus was about to open up a, a, a time of learning in their life. And Jesus says to them, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, right? This man couldn't have sinned in birth, right? I mean, whatever you want to say about the child in the womb, uh, not really a whole lot of sin he can carry on while he's being developed, right? So the man did not sin. And God says the parents, the reason the man is blind is not because of the parents. And God didn't make this man blind uh, just so he could be blind, right? But God uses him in his adult life to show that Jesus Christ is the light of the world and bring glory. So, this is what Jesus says about what's going on here. He's taking it from the abstract and bringing it down to what's really where the rubber meets the road. Uh, and takes it from where they're, they're having uh, meetings about what's going on and talking about what's going on. Christ brings action to the problem. But that the works of God should be revealed in him. This is why this man was blind. He was blind because death and disease and physical blindness entered in. Uh, still, there's a great deal of, of blindness in some of these sub areas because of uh, you know, different uh, sexual diseases. As the child passes through the birth canal, they are born blind. So, uh, very common in that day for this to happen. But Jesus said this particular man was born with a purpose. And by the way, I need you to understand this. All of us, however we were born, whatever defects and decays, diseases that we may have, we've all been born with a higher purpose. With a God call on our life. Again, him being able to take whatever we can give him and he can bless it and he can multiply it and he can bless us and we can bless others as he releases us from the, the chains of death and the, the victory that uh, sin has over us and the slave ship that we're under. He said, I must work the works of him who sent me while in the day. The night is coming when no man will work. Or can work. Now think about this. Jesus is saying, I have a short time left. The light of the world is going to go away. And there's going to be a period of darkness until the Spirit of God comes in on the 
day of Pentecost. So while I'm here, I am going to work while it is day. And he says, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Again, reminding people who he is, the miracle that's going to show just how much light he can bring into the life of somebody physically. And the idea here is if he can change somebody physically with his life, imagine what his light does to them spiritually. So powerful is his light spiritually that the Apostle Paul tells us that he makes us into new creations. That old things pass away and behold all things become new under the light that Jesus brings to us spiritually. And when he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with a saliva and anointed the eyes of the blind man with clay. Now Jesus certainly can heal any way he wants to, right? Perhaps as some of the old, old people used to say that since he, man, was made from the earth that, that Jesus was just putting that clay there to create him a new set of eyes. Maybe uh, he just wanted to put that on his eyes so it would drive him to go wash that stuff off. Aren't you glad he only did that right or we'd have a denomination of spit and clay back somewhere. <laughs> and get in the door, you'd have to have a little spittle and a little clay on your eye. Whatever it is, he's able to do this. And notice how he heals. You, you get into these healers now who, who can heal heart palpitations or maybe some sciatica pain, stuff that you can't really notice or maybe they progressively get well. When Jesus comes, it's just like heaven. Remember, he's bringing down uh, shafts of light of heaven to us, and he heals instantly and completely. No sight, no problem. Unable to walk, able to walk. Dead, being carried out of the city in the coffin, rise up. Sick, near death. So much so that Peter's mother-in-law was sick. He healed her, nigh to death. She got up and went to work making tea cakes. I hope so. She went up and served him, right? When I'm getting better, I don't feel like serving. No, I don't really feel like much serving when I'm feeling good. I really don't feel like serving after I'm coming up out of bed from being sick. No, he healed her completely, and she went back to work. Complete is how he does it. And he says to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is sin. By the way, Hebrew is shallow. So here in the pool, right, that Hezekiah built, uh, whenever the Syrians were going to attack, there was a river branch breaking off of the Kidron River, and so to ensure that there would be a supply of water, this is all back in Isaiah and uh, in the second king, up, and don't ask me where it is, I'd have to dig it out, but it's there, and I will if you need me to, but not right now. He made a tunnel from that branch and brought that water into the city to a pool area called Shiloh, which meant scent also. So maybe the place was named scent because the water was sent from one place to another place. And the Israelites had rejected that pool of water at Shiloh Jesus says, or, or Isaiah says, but here Jesus brings back the purpose of the pool was to provide life in that city. And he tells that guy, and it's off the temple a little bit, so he's got to make some effort with spit clay on his eyes to find that pool and go wash his face to get that off. Again, all of this acting in faith, you know, faith goes when God tells you. That's a good reason to be sent somewhere, right? Because God sent you. Remember, Abraham was called to a country not his own, and it was accounted to him as righteousness because he believed God because he was sent. You and I can activate our faith when we go, when we are sent to go somewhere. Or we carry the good news of the gospel to others. Or we show mercy in our giving or, or, or helping someone else. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Now, he had never seen light 
never seen beauty, never experienced sight, and now he sees, well, it's an illustration of mankind. Having now been given these eyes, he's able to see the most beautiful form there'll ever be, and that is that man called Christ. Again, we're called to examine him in the full light of who he was and what he done, and if we look at him and examine him and open our hearts and minds to what he has done for us uh, on that cross and what he continues to do for us in heaven and how he answers our prayers, if we continue to examine him, we'll find that again, uh, he's altogether lovely. So he sees, and therefore his neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is this not he who sat in bed? We don't know his name, right? We live over there by his mom and daddy's house. I see him sitting out there. I see him. Ain't, he, ain't that him? And some says, This is he. Others says, He is like him. And he said, I am he. Getting to the bottom of the mystery, hey God, it really is me. There is something that is taking place in my life. And therefore they said, then how were your eyes open? And he answered and said, a man, right? Now notice the progression here as he gets to know a little bit about Jesus. He begins to ruminate and meditate on the wonders that Christ has done. If you will, underline that word man. Man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, now he didn't tell him how he made the clay, right? Go to the pool of Shalom and wash. So I went and washed and I received my sight. Right obedience begets blessing. Write that down. That sounds good to me. Not his works, right? This is obedience. Not his, not his righteousness, but his obedience. And they said, where is he? And he said, I do not know. They brought him who was formerly blind to the Pharisees. Well, now that's exactly the first place I want to go, right? Right? I want to go to the Pharisees. That's what I want to see. He's self-righteous. Jesus was able to call him hypocrite, so I'll just uh, let him say that over in Matthew chapter 23. Now it was to say, oh, here's the problem, right? Here that Jesus is making somebody whole again on the Sabbath. Now this was not against anything in the Ten Commandments. Remember, Jesus already said that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Remember, he's already said that. What law that he had breaking, broken was those pack of traditional laws that they put in place so that they wouldn't sin. They didn't want to get close to the sin, so they made... Uh, buffer zones for themselves. Jesus didn't need any buffer zone because he didn't he didn't sin. There was nothing about him that enjoyed sin, liked sin, could be tempted by sin. Again, Christ in capability. That is that that uh, he was altogether holy, utterly holy, and separate from sin. And again, we talked about that when we begin to list off those verses of sin. When they asked in verse 46, when he asked in verse 46, uh, who convicts me of sin? Again, 2 Corinthians 5.21, Hebrews 4.15, uh, Hebrews 7.26, and 1 Peter 2.22. Again, he never knew sin. Uh, he's separate from sin. He'd been tempted like us, and yet in all points been never tempted by sin. And again, he's holy, innocent, undefiled, and separate from sinners. And again, he never committed any sin. So uh, here the problem is that they, they had misdiagnosed what was going on here. That Jesus was not in sin. Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. And the Pharisees also asked him again how he received his sight. And he, he said, he put the clay on my eyes and I washed my seed. Therefore some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. He don't do what we say needs to be done. And how we would do it. He could have just, well, let that guy sit there one more day and come back the next day and it would have been all right with us. No, Brother Tony, I, I need you to know something, folks. Whatever Jesus did, it was never enough. 
for these people. It was never going to be enough. They were an evil, adulterous generation according to Christ who sought after a sign and every sign he showed them was not enough. Every word he spoke to them was not enough. They were cut off from the light. They had no desire for light. Jesus did not come into this world to condemn the world, but the world might through him might be saved. And they didn't want any part of it. Again, we said with a whole generation of people that spew out stuff in our media who want no part of it and don't want you to have any part of it. Others said, how can this man who is a sinner do such signs? There was a division, a division among them. Well, of course it was. Can't sit on the fence. Either he's Christ or he's crazy. Either he's the light of the world or he's a lunatic. Either he's telling the truth or he is out there uh, pulling everybody's leg. So he brings division. And we read how he did that. Verse 17 says, And they said to the blind man again, What do you say about him? Because he opened your eyes. And he said he's a prophet. I'm a man, now he's a prophet. Having ruminated on this a little bit, it's obvious that he was more than just a man. He must be in this uh, new seeing guy's eyes, this formerly blind man's eyes, uh, he must be something extra special. And since there was a great division and Pharisees didn't want to just come out and say anything else, they asked this guy's opinion. Well, I'm telling you something. If I'm hungry and you come up and, 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 and feed me, my opinion of you uh, at that moment, if I've never met you before, may be one of such that, you know, I think that's a pretty fine guy right there. I look pretty fine lady today. She's taking care of my needs. Or if somebody asks me, I say, you just don't know who she is. I say, well, I know what she's done. Basically, that's it. You don't know who he is, but his works, what has he done? He's not killed anybody. He's healed everybody. He's not called anybody out. He's been in Samaria uh, preaching and healing. He's been up to uh, Caesarea Philippi, another Gentile area, healing and uh, received more people there than he did even in his hometown of Nazareth. He hadn't killed anybody. He's raised people from the dead at this point. His works should say that there's something from heaven about him. So the progression is from man to prophet, but the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they had called his parents to him, had, uh, of him who had received his sight. And they asked them, saying, Is this your son who was born blind? How then does he now see? And his parents answered and said, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But by what means he now sees, we do not know, or who opened his eyes, we do not know. He is of age, ask him, he will speak for himself. And his parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed that he was Christ, that he would be put out of the synagogue. Wow. Talk about that, right? Imagine your mom and your dad throwing you out there in front of those people, right? It's much more important to be part of that religion than to stay part of the family. I don't know if I went over there and ate Christmas dinner with them after that. I'm just saying. That would have struck, stuck in my crop. But, but you know, when he gets cast out of the synagogue, basically he can't go back to his mom and dad's house anyway. He's cut off. He's an outcast. Let's talk about that in a minute. So again, they called the man who was blind and said to him, Give God the glory. Well, certainly that's what he's doing, right? From a man to a prophet, we know this man is a sinner. Now he, that's the blind man, answered and said, Whether he is a sinner or not, I do not know one thing. I know that though I was blind, now I see. He has made a difference in me. 
Again, the whole idea here is that once you know Christ, once He's blessed you, changed you, lived in you, uh, cleaned you up, saved your soul, He makes an absolute difference in you. Again, your desires begin to become His desires. Your love for the Father becomes His love for the Father. Uh, his love for the, for the Word of God becomes your love for the Word of God. His desire to spend time with the Father becomes your desire to spend time with the Father. Uh, again, I look through the Bible from back to forth, and what I see is that the believer, those who are saints of God, cannot wait to. Their ultimate goal is to be in the presence of the Lord. And that becomes your goal. And you sit around and say, well, I wonder if they're really saved. Well, what are they really doing? What are they really doing? Are they in the Bible? Are they in fellowship with other Christians at church? Have they got away from filthy language? Have they stopped taking in uh, imbibing alcohol? Have they... Have they have they moved away from some of these things and still trying to be a, a drunkard and, and, and become a filled with the Spirit of God? Remember? That's why it says, no longer be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. No longer be controlled by some kind of toxic substance from the outside of the body. Drugs and fentanyl and all that kind of stuff. But being controlled by the Spirit of God. You want a good night's sleep? You may need a little medication, but you might need just a little prayer before you go to bed too. Clean yourself off. Get rid of that junk out of your life. Lord, protect me as I sleep. Or forgive me of my sins. Oh, I know it's not the end all and be all, right? I, I'm certainly not against medication, but I'm just trying to tell you that uh, there's more in Christ. And He makes a difference. This guy says he's made a difference. And they said to him again, what did he do and how did he open your eyes? Right, this is about the fourth time. He answered, I told you already. He did not listen. That's really their problem. They never listen. They keep hearing it and hearing it and hearing it and it does not match up with what they think it should match up with so they disqualify it. People are, are, are always putting up with God's Word, like we said. And if God's Word, those sermons don't match what they got going on in their life, they'll just quit coming to church. Or find them someplace where the preaching matches up with the life they want to live. These people did not want to live the life that Christ was offering. They would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Oh, no, he didn't. And they reviled him and said, now the word revile is a very strong thing, right? You've got to, they, they probably snorting and spitting and starting to pluck their beards and getting the ira up and, and the dander's flaking. And it's some, they reviled him and said, are you his disciples? But we are Moses' disciples. Oh, see, they don't understand how much greater than Moses is there. Right? Grab whatever you want and whatever it is, Christ is much more better. Much greater than. Grab your, your latest philosopher. Grab your latest book from the Open Winter Book Club. Christ is greater than that. We know that God spoke to Moses. That's for this father. We do not know where he's from. Well, they've been telling him for, for five or six weeks now that he's, he's from Nazareth and Capernaum and, and every place but Bethlehem. And Jesus told him the last time we were together seven times that he had come down from heaven. He didn't stutter any of the times he said that. And the man answered and said, Why, this is a marvelous thing that you do not know where he is from, yet he has opened my eyes. Now we know that God does not hear sinners. Well, that makes sense to me. One really wants to hear one thing from them. I'm a 
sinner. Hmm. I need Jesus. But if anyone is the worship of God and does the will, he hears him. Right? Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone has opened the eyes of anyone who was born. Now you uh, you take that, you look back to the Bible. Uh, there were some people raised from the dead. There was a couple of other miracles out there, but nobody's been cured of blindness. Why? Because they were never the light of the world. So what's changed? The light of the world has come into the world. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And they answered and said to him, You are completely born in sin. Well, basically, he just they called him an illegitimate child. With all the words that that meant. And why are they able to say that? Well, they say that because he was born blind. The very fact that you were born blind shows that you were completely in sin. Jesus said this man had not sinned nor his parents had sinned. They don't even know where to judge things right for sin, right? They judge after the flesh. And they said to him, and, 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 are, and are you teaching us? Well, somebody needed to teach him, and they cast him out. Cast him out of what? Cast him out of the synagogue. Cast out of that synagogue and cast on to Christ. Cast out of religion and cast on to Jesus. I'm telling you, that is a good place to land. And Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and he went and found him and said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? And he said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking to you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus received that worship. Why? Because he's God. And here is one of the remnant of Israel. Right there. Saved. Right there. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may be blind. If you recognize that you are blind, you'll be able to see. But if you say, keep saying that you see, you'll never realize that you're blind. That's what he's saying. I've come in here, and for those people who finally realize that all this other stuff is nothing and I am everything, I'm going to make them see and for all those people to hang on to their good works and their good titles in other way. Remember, he's already told them the reason you can't go to heaven because your sin is a barrier to you. You can't get that way the way you're going. I'll have to make the way for you where they keep grinding those curves and those mazes, running into those dead ends, and turn around trying to find another way. And until they find Christ, they will not find the way their sin blinds them and, and is a barricade to them. And some of the Pharisees who heard these words said to him, Are we blind also? And he said, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you say we see, therefore your sin remains. I guess that'd be a yes. I guess that's it. Well, that's all I know about that.